morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to today's webinar on solving test puzzles with policies, strategies, and plans. I am Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. We have a team of international consultants that deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I am the author of over a dozen books on software testing, as well as being the past president of the ISTQB. Attendance of today's webinar earns PMI PDUs. Thank you to Vicki Sasser for reviewing the materials for PDU status and for making valuable suggestions. Attendees will receive an email telling them how to claim PDUs, including the PDU code. PDUs are available for live webinar attendance only. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, you may submit them at any time, but please note that they will be answered at the end. I hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not-just-for-profit company. If you enjoy our free webinars and feel that they demonstrate solid insights into the kinds of testing challenges you face, please make RBCS your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. We're happy to provide a quote for any such help you might need. Contact us at info at rbcs-us.com. Okay, so... Policies, strategies, and plans. These are terms that attract some amount of confusion. Well, hopefully by the end of uh, today, on the end of the hour, this hour, you'll have a clear idea of what, what they are and uh, what purpose they can serve. Um, they do help clarify and answer some very important questions, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, so these things should not be thought of as like soulless IEEE 829 templates that seem a lot like tax forms and have to get filled out and don't do anything clearly or at least obviously to advance progress, but rather these should be seen as, as relevant um, tools that help you understand and communicate about some of the um, pressing challenges that we face as test professionals. So here are some of the critical questions that um, don't always get answered, which having policies, strategies, and plans in place can help you answer. So what should testing accomplish? What are you trying to do? Sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, you know, shuffle of work, or maybe it's not a shuffle, it's a frenzy, um, and the urgent keeps driving out the important, but really, shouldn't we have some idea of what we're trying to accomplish, what our objectives are, and how would we recognize that we were actually successfully accomplishing those? In our personal lives, we do things like set financial goals, say we want to have a certain amount of money in the bank, want to have certain types of personal projects done in a, in a particular point, uh, period of time, but not always so good at getting that clear in our testing work. How should we go about doing testing just in general? What are the sort of patterns of behaviors that uh, um, will allow us to succeed, the best practices of, of testing which can be implemented for us? Have we spent time thinking about those, recognizing them? Now, for any given release or project or even iteration, what specifically needs to be done in order to carry out that those best practices and accomplish those goals? You need to think about that. We also need to think about what could go wrong while we're trying to do that and how we can manage those risks, the things that could happen that would uh, interfere with our ability to carry out our plan testing activities. And all this, of course, happens in the in a broader context, a software development life cycle. So what is that life cycle? And how, how does that life cycle affect um, what you're doing and what you're saying in your policy, strategy, and plans? 
So these are the, the puzzle pieces that we're trying to, to solve with uh, a policy strategy and plans. Uh, and we're going to touch on some of these points as we go along today, give you a better idea of what exactly I mean. So the test policy, this is the why we test. It says this is this is what we're trying to accomplish. What are the overall objectives? And it uh, ideally spans the entire organization. Um, I've worked with some clients to help them institute pol test policies where for various reasons, such as significant differences between uh, different uh, entities within the organization, they had to have different policies. But you should generally try to have this defined at the highest level possible for sake of, of consistency. If it gets to the point where trying to define a uniform policy across multiple groups in the organization it becomes too vague or too convoluted, like, well, if this is true, do you know we're trying to do this, but if that's true, we're trying to do that, then you know you, you should feel free to have separate policies. But certainly, if you're if you're down to the point of for a specific release or specific development project putting together a, a test policy for that, you know, that's too low level. This is usually something where at the senior management, executive management level, we're trying to have a communication about what are we trying to accomplish with testing? Why are we doing it? What is its business value? How would we measure whether we were being effective at it? Are we accomplishing those objectives in a, in, in a sufficient fashion? Efficiency. We're not only accomplishing the objectives in an in a effective fashion, but are we doing it in a way that is um, wise with respect to utilization of some resource or resources? What resource do we want to optimize for? Is it time to release? Is it, is it uh, budget? Is it uh, staff hours? So you need to think about that. Uh, what does a typical test process look like? We may or may not want to include this in a test policy because this gets into the how, which is more of a strategy, as I'll get to in a minute. But some organizations do like to have some sort of graphical overview of what the, uh, what the typical test process looks like. How do we improve the process over time? Again, this may or may not be something that you want to address in your policy, but you might want to have that in there, um, especially if that's sort of an organizational thing is that every every type of activity needs to have some provision for how it how it improves over time. So those last two, you know, maybe you include those, maybe you don't. This should be a short document. Ideally, it's one, two pages long. Um, I've seen situations where clients ended up putting together 10 or 15 page policies and um, you get an issue uh, with um, people not really reading it. It's, it's Remember, what we're trying to do here is communicate to senior stakeholders, senior test stakeholders, that this is why testing is important. Uh, sometimes you hear this phrase, elevator speech, um, and Basically, that's kind of what your test policy is. It's 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 the if you are in an elevator with a with an executive level person and talking to them about testing and why it matters, what you accomplish, how you measure accomplishment, and so forth. That the test policy is what you would say to that person. This is an example of a. Uh, anonymized uh, test policy document that I helped a client put together uh, a number of years ago. Not perfect, but it's food for thought. You notice we have a, we have a mission statement there. Um, effectively and efficiently provide timely, accurate, and useful quality risk management information and services. So help the organization manage the risks of quality related issues to their software and production. Um, we have a brief description of the uh, strategy is primarily a risk-based testing strategy that also includes other elements such as reactive strategies and so forth. Um, we talk about that here, just a, just a brief uh, description. Now notice that we have a discussion of the different test levels and the way that the test levels are sequenced is described here and the ownership of those levels is, is um, 
uh, divvied out. The team that I was working with is the, the risk mitigation and quality assurance team. That was their, their name. Um, you notice that unit and integration testing are owned by development, acceptance testing owned by the business. See that? Um, we have defined objectives for each level of testing. Um, and then we have um, key areas to test, basically test types that need to be covered there. So this is valuable um, and to use a test policy to uh, provide for coordination of, uh, of uh, activities across different groups. Of course, you know, there needs to be buy-in here in this case. We have to have the uh, development uh, management and business uh, management um, bought into this um, distribution of effort. On this page, you see that we did have a, a, a graphic view of the test process as it applies to each level. This is going to give people an idea of, okay, this is what needs to be carried out. Um, and the KPIs, key process indicators, this is where the effectiveness and efficiency metrics were uh, to go. We, um, well, the client continued this work after I was done getting this initial piece in place for them. So they ended up filling in the blanks here. So as you can see, there is still some work to be done. Um, and that, that is something that needs to be done carefully, this defining of metrics. Um, if, if, it's, if it's done badly, it can, it can go uh, quite wrong. Pardon me, a little drink of water there. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't caught it out on the RBCS YouTube channel, which I'll show you the coordinates for later when we get into the Q&A session, I have a uh, recorded webinar um, called uh, Stupid Metrics Tricks and How to Avoid Them. And there's also a recording of me giving that, that same presentation as a uh, keynote speech, uh, actually twice, once in uh, Moscow at the Heisenberg Conference and once in Portland, Oregon at the PNSQC Conference. Um, so you, could, you can uh, listen to those. The PNSQC presentation of it include the uh, Deming uh, red bead, white bead experiment, which if you've never seen it done is is worth uh, worth a listen. But anyway, that's a, it's just a cautionary tale here about, you know, filling in the blanks on the metrics part of this is not, it should not be seen as an, oh, well, that's easy. And, you know, just whatever comes shooting out of whatever test management tool or ALM tool or task management tool we're using, that's the metric we're going to use. That, that's That's likely not to turn out well. So the policy is the why, what are we trying to accomplish? The strategy is the how. It's a general way that we go about testing from one release to the next. So it should be written as, as like patterns that we've observed that tend to produce good outcomes from one project to the next. And another name for a pattern that's associated with producing good outcomes is a best practice. Um, so we want to we want to say these these are what we find to be best practices for uh, testing in in our uh, particular organization. Now, as as a consultant working with a lot of different clients, I see patterns of patterns, as, as it were, patterns in in test strategies, uh, kind of common common things um, that I that I see present in there, and and so. Based on that, there's, there's some uh, types of strategies that are, are identified. Um, those are uh, in the um, ISTQB uh, foundation syllabus, including the new one, the 2018 one that I just um, uh, was a project manager for in the first half of this year, um, and in the advanced test manager and also in the expert test manager. Um, and so th these are things that um, that you can do some further research on if you want to go look at look at different types of strategies. I also have done a, a webinar on that of uh, the different types of test strategies and explaining what they are and their strengths and weaknesses, application of them. But um, the the point here being that you should be able to identify of of these common types of strategies multiple. Uh, strategies that are applicable for your uh, organization. 
um, for your projects. And so you should um, make sure that as you're putting your, your test strategy in place, you're looking at um, these common best practices uh, that have been observed by people like me, um, consultants who work with clients around the world. Uh, so things like risk-based testing, requirements-based testing, building models for performance or for functional testing, using reactive techniques, especially um, in conjunction with things like exploratory testing. So come up with um, come up with a good blend of uh, uh, strategies, strategy types as you're implementing your, your strategy. Don't leave anything valuable out. Now, um, your strategy should be tailored to your specific situation. Um, you know, you're dealing with safety critical types of systems. Your strategy has to be tuned to be uh, one that is very, very effective in terms of, of reducing risk of failure in production, very effective in terms of detecting defects. Um, if there are regulatory requirements, you need to make sure that your strategy addresses those regulatory requirements. Basically, every objective that's laid out in your policy, you should be able to point to elements of your strategy that support accomplishing that objective. If not, you, you've got a gap in, in your strategy. And it's true the other way around, too, that it, anything in your strategy, anything your, that your strategy says, yes, yeah, says testing, we do this, and testing, we do that. You should be able to say, we do this because, because we're trying to accomplish this objective. So that's a good sanity check here to make sure that you're not just documenting stuff for the sake of documenting it. You know, you've got, you, you said in the policy, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And now here's how we're trying to accomplish it. Now, um, the, the issue of documenting it, um, you know, this can be documented in various ways. I mean, it can be documented in a, in a Word document. It can end up in a PDF but I have plenty of clients that are doing things like having confluence pages and uh, wiki pages and so forth. Um, and that's good to have those uh, posted like that. But remember, if you do that, you need to keep track of um, are people actually referring to them? Okay. So um, go look at the hit rates on those um, on those pages that describe the strategy. And, you know, if nobody's ever looking at it, then you, you obviously have a relevance issue. Now, what goes in the test strategy document? Well, basically anything that is common and universal across multiple releases is a candidate. Um, how you manage uh, defects, so the whole defect life cycle, the tools that are used to track the defects, those kinds of things, that's an obvious candidate. Um, where your test cases and, or test procedures or whatever you call them, where do those get stored and how do those get tracked? Uh, how's the status assigned? Um, is there other stuff that needs to be managed? Uh, other, other work products that need to be managed, uh, data, uh, for example, test data, um, how is test data produced? Are there uh, are you using production data? Is it anonymized? If so, how is that anonymization process handled? Um, how are you utilizing test automation? Um, what constitutes a proper confirmation test when you get a bug fix back? How how is somebody supposed to do a proper confirmation test? They run just the steps to reproduce the failure from the uh, associated uh, defect report, or do they actually have to run every single test that failed because of that defect as well. Um, what's the level of documentation that's supposed to be gathered for a test case? What constitutes a properly documented test case? What are some examples of uh, test case documentation mistakes, over-documenting or under-documenting? Where are your environments? How do they get used? Now, this is all stuff that tends to be true across multiple releases, and so it's a good candidate. One of the things I did for a client once that, that didn't have a strategy, they just, they had plans, 
was I came in and I looked at about a dozen of their plans and I said, you know, guys, you notice how every time when you create a plan, a test plan, you just take a previous project test plan and use that as a template and like 80% of the stuff you don't change. And they're like, yeah, I said, well, that's your test strategy. <laughs> that That is what belongs in the test strategy because that stuff doesn't change. So rather than drag that documentation around and, and, and have people wading through it over and over again, and they've already seen it before, you know, put it out there in a separate document, a separate repository, what have you. Um, and then there's your strategy. And what need, what goes in your plan then is how you're going to execute on the strategy for a particular release, which I'll get into in a minute. All right, so hopefully that's clear so far. The policy is the, is the why and the strategy is the how in a general sense, uh, independent of project. And then the plan is the execution of the strategy for a project or release. Now, we could get into that in a minute, but I want to give you kind of, a, of another example out of a test strategy here. It's a little food for thought. Um, I was working with a client, helping them define a test strategy, and they um, they were in a interesting situation that they had, um, and not, not an all that unusual uh, situation, where they had a data center that has about 100 uh, applications in it, and those applications are of, of varying levels of importance. And then they, they have projects that occur that deal with those applications. And, and those projects are of varying levels of risk from an organizational point of view. So what they, what they would do at the beginning of a project is do a, a risk assessment for the project. Look at, you know, how, how bad would it be if we had quality problems with this particular piece of software that we're creating, what have you. Um, so they come up with a rating collectively across project stakeholders and participants of what the, the overall initial risk is, okay? And then what we said is, okay, so based on that initial risk assessment, we are going to define a sort of a general approach that you should take, how you should apply the, your, your test strategy to that project. And the client suggested that we use metals here. So what you see in the approach column are the um, uh, periodic table symbols for different metals. So PL is platinum, um, AU is gold, um, AG is silver, PB is lead, and HG is mercury. Um, and so what we said, if we look at the top row there that, that corresponds to the platinum approach, we said there's, there's a generic uh, test process, a general test process described in the strategy. Um, and there's um, a level of rigor associated with unit testing described in the strategy. And there's a level of rigor associated with how code reviews and uh, user story reviews, user story refinement, and so forth, are all to be carried out. Those are defined in the test strategy. So there is to be no variance in terms of that process uh, prior to starting the um, system test. Okay, so all the upstream activities are to be carried out in a very rigorous fashion. And then during the system testing, for anything that's considered to be mission critical, we will do extensive testing. Anything that's non-mission critical, we will do broad testing and we will automate regression tests wherever possible. Exit criteria or definition of done will be formulated so that we have a high level of coverage, a high level of confidence, and we've assured a high level of quality. And the residual risk at this point at the end of system testing should be low to very low. So hopefully you all follow that. Now the next level down there, something that's, that's been uh, determined to be a high but not a very high risk um, in this in this pre you know, the release planning um, uh, risk assessment, the, the decision was this is high risk. Um, we do allow for some amount of variance in terms of the level of rigor from a process point of view, unit test point of view, or review point of view. And notice if you look at the coverage and risk mitigation column, um, we're relaxing our 
general coverage criteria here. We're saying, yeah, for the mission critical stuff, the MC stuff, that's, we're going to test that broad. We're not going to be extensive. Um, for the non-mission critical stuff, you know, we're going to do cursory testing, but, you know, that's it. For the regression testing, we're just we're going to focus on manual tests. We'll get good coverage, good confidence, good quality, but, you know, not high, okay? Notice that we still end up with a low to very low residual risk because, you know, we've, we've relaxed just enough. And so on down the line, you know, medium initial risk, we have the, the silver um, approach, which allows more latitude. The low initial risk, we have the lead approach, which allows considerable latitude. So it's basically, you know, development team, do whatever you think you need to do, and then just give it to us, and we'll do a little opportunistic testing on stuff, and then out, out it goes, because it's not very high risk. And then the very low mercury, well, we don't test it, right, because, you know, mercury, it's liquid, it just runs right through. So anyway, um, so that was the... Uh, the model that we came up with. Now, one of the things that, that happened in this organization is that they would, they would have situations where stuff uh, was under some pretty significant time constraints and sometimes budget constraints. Usually it was more of a time issue because uh, they were in a uh, consumer entertainment space and they, they had projects that were associated with particular events that were going to occur. So um, <clears throat> what we had to do is have a way of saying to the client, look, or, or to the, the stakeholders, excuse me, uh, business stakeholders especially, look, if, if, you, if you are going to pressure us and pressurize the development teams into being less rigorous and, and us into doing less testing, uh, we can use a lower than recommended strategy um, or approach, uh, but you're going to accept. You're going to have to accept a higher level of residual risk. So that's what this table shows here. So let's say that the initial risk is assessed to be very high, but senior management says, "Look, we don't have time for the platinum approach that you're recommending. We only have time for the silver approach." And then you would say, the, te the test manager or director of testing would say, well, if we do that, that's fine, but understand that there's a high to medium residual risk of failures in production if you do that. So this is basically a way of, of putting that in front of management, one table, say, look, you know, if you're willing to accept the increased level of risk, this is, this is what's going to happen. So that turned out to be very valuable um, to them, the, the ability to communicate that effectively. Okay, so we had the policy, the the um, why strategy, the general how to test, and then the plan is, you know, on this specific release, this is what this is how we're going to implement the strategy. Now. This should, as I mentioned from the outset, but policies, strategies, and plans should also all be aids to getting you to think through challenges that are going to occur and figure out solutions to them before they erupt as some kind of panic. Um, and also to be able to communicate uh, to the appropriate people about what is being done and why it's being done. Now, in some cases, you may want to have multiple test plans um, if you're addressing different audiences, like if you've got a hardware element and a software element, pretty typical to have a hardware and a software test plan. If you've got different levels of testing, it's pretty typical to have different test plans for the different levels, and acceptance test versus system test, say. You have a risk, though, if you, if you have multiple test plans that they're not going to be coordinated and you'll get people pulling in different directions. I have a client that they have like seven or eight different levels of testing that happen before they ultimately have software set up in their customers' data centers and 
doing stuff for their customers who are investment bankers. And I talked to the uh, CEO once and asked him, you know, what is your main pain point, your main point of frustration with software testing? And he said, the main problem I have is that we, we have all these different groups that are doing it and they're, they, they all have their own plans and they're doing their own thing. If I go to those people and I ask, well, what's being tested? I get all these different stories. And when my customers ask me, well, how, how can I have confidence that you, that this software is going to work properly? Uh, what, what did you test? He said, I don't have any sort of unified view. So if you're going to have different groups that are responsible for different areas of testing and they've got their own plans, having some way of coordinating uh, across those is, is definitely a good practice. And that's uh, the ISDQB name for that anyway is master test plan. You can call it whatever you want, um, but uh, you know, making sure that there is some coordination. And that coordination can happen at the strategy level too, um, as we, or even at the policy level as we saw. Just make sure that you do have the coordination. Now, um, planning um, is something that's that should be thought of as, as I said, as communication. Um, so you want to make sure that as you're putting your plans together, you are circulating drafts and getting getting some discussion going, identifying misunderstandings that might exist, so forth. Now, in terms of what goes into the test plan, well, implementation of the strategy. So what, as an example of that, um, let's say that in your test strategy, you talk about doing risk-based testing. And you say, okay, well, the beginning of each iteration, the um, uh, development team, including the tester, will sit down, they'll go through the user stories that have been selected for that iteration, and they will... Um, do a risk analysis for those user stories, and then they'll come up with a list of, of risks and their associated likelihoods and impacts, and thus the risk priority number for those risks, and then they'll make sure that they uh, um, estimate effort and, and, uh, and test accordingly. So that's a general statement about how risk-based testing is gonna be done on a particular, uh, in any particular, um, uh, iteration, but it doesn't say, you know, specifically how it's going to happen. So during release planning, when you're writing the test plan, you might add some detail in there about who are to be the participants in the risk analysis, how that gets fit specifically into the schedule, uh, the, the cadence of the iteration, and so forth. Um, identifying what's in scope and what's out of scope, that may happen at the strategy level, or it might have to be something that's done on a uh, uh, project by project uh, basis, release by release basis. Um, sort of the, the patterns of, of how test execution gets carried out, how does software get handed over um, to be tested, and then what tests get run. This can be especially critical in, um, in agile projects, what that, what that pattern looks like to make sure that you don't lose any time because you, you know, you of course don't have any time to spare. Um, you want to avoid situations where stuff is dropping in to the team that, or dropping to the tester to embedded within a team, depending on how you're approaching it, you know, within one or two days of an iteration ending, because that's a great way to have some showstopper bug pop up and uh, uh, create a big scramble. I just saw that for a client earlier this year. Uh, your definitions of done, your definitions of ready, if you're in Agile, should be in the test plan unless they're generic enough to be in the strategy. Um, entry, exit criteria, suspension, resumption, or continuation criteria. If you're using those phrases, that would be the equivalent type of thing. Um, how you're going to deal with test-related project risks that are specific to this release. Uh, how you make decisions about when testing uh, needs to be halted, those sort of things. Now, one thing that I've done in, in test plans um, where there were a lot of, there was a lot of coordination going on, 
is to um, show things with pictures. And so this is an example from a, a test plan where we have work going on in uh, Taiwan on the left, California in the middle, and Utah on the right. And um, what you see is the flow of various kinds of work products uh, uh, between different groups. Um, when you have work that's split up across a lot of different groups, um, you do have risk of miscommunication and missed handoffs. So um, that's something that, uh, that you might consider doing. This, of course, could be documented in a table, um, but I think uh, a picture can be a little bit more compelling. Now, of course, if there's if it gets more complicated than this, and you've got you know a lot more circles representing the groups and arrows representing the the work product flows, then then you might have to go with a table because it's just too ugly. This is a similar kind of um, picture that shows work products flowing between different entities, groups within the project team. Um, so this is this is another way of, of like showing how things get handed off. Because again, my point here being that uh, handoffs are are common places where breakdowns occur, and so um, you know be careful with uh, making sure that you identify that. Now again, this stuff if this if this is general, not specific to a particular. Um, project or release, but is, is true generally, then, you know, feel free to uh, kick this up into your strategy. Basically, anything that's going to be the same from one release or one project to the next, uh, ideally, is going to be in the strategy rather than the plan. Now, definitely a key thing to work out, either in your strategy or your plan, again, depends on whether this is release slash project specific or not, um, is this issue of how software gets delivered uh, for testing. Now, some of my clients have this really nailed down quite well, and they've got um, these delivery pipelines, continuous integration systems where they're you know, able to, to chunk out new releases you know, hourly. Um, and if not more frequently, and, and uh, the process is pretty well automated. But even even with some of those situations, I've seen um, scenarios where software got put into a test environment and testers were running tests on the test environment. They didn't know that the software had been put in and it invalidated the results of their tests and they had to start over. So, you know, that's, uh, that, that's not good. Anything that uh, reduces your test efficiency is, of course, to be avoided. Um, that said, you know, these these kinds of continuous integration or delivery pipelines and so forth uh, um, can be a can be an aid when used properly. It's certainly better than, you know, some sort of manual or partially manual process, which that always really worries me when I have a client describing a process that involves a lot of manual intervention because that's, you know, very error prone and difficult to repeat. But we want to look at things like, okay, how frequently do we get releases? How do they get installed? If a bad build gets pushed into an environment, um, how do we get it out? Virtualization can be helpful with that. Uh, how are the builds named or are the revision levels assigned? How do we figure out what the revision level is? How do we ask the software, what version are you? This is really important, of course, because you want to record what version of the software you tested when you run your tests. And of course, if you find a defect, you want to uh, uh, record that as well. Um, if you're doing a uh, system of systems types of tests, um, where there are multiple systems um, changing at the same time, or there's an underlying database, um, that might be changing. Make sure that you address synchronization there. I've seen situations where that got really out of hand and uh, systems were being changed without concern or thought about how that change was going to affect other systems and 
we were trying to do a system integration test and it just, it was a big old mess. Um, and of course, who owns what? The roles and responsibilities. Um, you wanna make sure that it's really clear. Here, here again, these, these automated frameworks, uh, automated delivery pipelines can, can be very helpful because they, they, you know, there's not a whole lot to do that's manual, um, but, you know, to, to the extent that somebody's responsible for something and, or somebody's responsible for fixing something, if it breaks, you want to know that because, you know, stuff will break. So <clears throat> whether in the strategy or in the, in the plan, make sure that you've addressed this. If you, if you can't get it, you can't test it, right? I mean, if you can't get a software release, you won't be able to run tests against it. So it's as simple as that. So this is, this is certainly critical. Another thing, very important, um, managing test-related project risks. This may, it may be possible to do some of this at the strategy level rather than at the plan level. Um, kind of depends on common uh, risks that recur from one release to the next and one project to the next. Um, you're probably going to have a mix, some sort of general test-related risk management steps that you take all the time so they're in the strategy, whereas others may be specific to a particular release or project. Now, keep in mind, any, any risk, there are basically four things you can do. Um, you can take preventive actions, try to mitigate the risk, reduce the likelihood of the risk becoming an outcome, and, re and potentially reduce the impact if the risk does become an outcome. You can also create a contingency plan, which is something that you'll do to try to contain the impact if the, the risk does become an outcome. In that case, you need to have what's called a trigger, how to recognize that you need to put the contingency plan into action, and also an owner who's responsible for executing on the contingency plan. Those would be important, because if you don't have them, then it won't happen. Now, another thing that you can do is transfer risk. In other words, take a test-related project risk and, and make it somebody else's problem. I'm not a huge fan of this just because you, there is no transference without the other party accepting the risk. And my experience with that has not been all that great. Um, people will say theoretically that they'll accept the consequences of some risk occurring, but then they, they actually don't. So in the classic example of this is to say that, well, you know, we need four days to test feature X. And so, you know, that, that feature has to be delivered to us four days prior to the end of the iteration or else it has to be slipped to the next iteration. And you might hear people say, oh, yes, indeed, that's, uh, that's definitely true, you know, during iteration planning at the beginning of a of an iteration, but then, you know, come, come the day when you say, well, all right, so, you know, that feature that we need four days to test, we haven't gotten it yet, and there's only three days left in the iteration, so that feature's going into the next uh, iteration. And then people are running around going, oh, no, no, the world will fall off of its axis and, and roll like a marble into the sun, and, you know, all the demons of hell will come bursting out and devour everybody's flesh if if we don't release this this feature in this iteration. So you're just going to test it uh, tomorrow, and and then of course you you know you find problems and it's a nightmare. So you know what you really what my what I would encourage you to do rather than setting yourself up for for those kinds of unpleasant situations just be ready to mitigate and or have a contingency plan in place. Um, you know, trans transferring sounds great, but, you know, it, it, it often doesn't work. And then, of course, for most risks, you're just going to ignore or accept them. I mean, there's all sorts of things that could happen. I mean, you know, right right now at this very moment, there could be a huge asteroid headed towards the Earth. You know, 
and there's nothing much any of us can do about it. Uh, so we do this all the time, or the things that are of relatively low likelihood um, or or low impact, or particularly both. You know, don't don't spend time on those because this this can turn this this trying to manage the, all the test related uh, project risks can turn into a real uh, uh, time consuming activity. You get caught up worrying about stuff that's just never going to happen. Meanwhile, you're not paying attention to things that definitely are going to happen. Now, another thing that I'll point out is, you know, um, any any particular option can uh, provide benefits and opportunities, but it also can come with costs, of course, and 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 can create additional risks. Now, I've seen situations where people triggered contingency plans that. I guess they thought were a good idea when they came up with them, but definitely made things worse. Um, so, you know, make sure that you think about um, the consequences of of the mitigations and the contingency plans, you know, especially the contingency plans. Is, as I said, it is it is possible that triggering a contingency plan um, could could actually create a, a worse situation. Okay, so um, addressing life cycles and how life cycles affect what we've been talking about. I've been trying to be sensitive to the issue of life cycles as we've gone along here, but just to kind of summarize some of the key points, um, certainly in your test policy, when you're putting metrics in place, um, you need to think about when, when those metrics will be gathered and, and how uh, with respect to um, life cycle. Um, in your strategy, your strategy is talking about how you're going to carry out your testing. So it's very much um, related to the, the larger life cycle within which it fits. So you have to be careful that the strategy is defined in such a way that it integrates testing properly into your actual life cycle. And I say actual life cycle to, to draw um, your attention to something that there's there's agile there are agile life cycles as they are defined in books, and there are traditional iterative life cycles like the rational unified process or RUP as it's defined, and there's rapid development as defined in books. And then there's descriptions of how the V model is supposed to work defined in books. Up until last week, I don't know that I, had, not last week, but last month, I don't know that I had ever seen a textbook implementation of a life cycle, meaning that they did everything exactly the way it was described in the book. And this is, this is a client that is doing a scrum slash safe um, life cycle. And so I went in there expecting to see what I always see, which is that their life cycle is, uh, would be a hybrid of, you know, it has some, some waterfallish or V model types of elements. It might have some of the more, um, traditional RUP type of things, overlapping of, of iterations and so forth and be actual agile scrum. This really was a scrum safe, shop I and mean, they just do it exactly that way so that was interesting to me and just in that it's it's all i almost never see that almost always what i see is that um there's some elements of different life cycles kind of blended in together like i i have a, a client that's in the gaming business that uses this life cycle that's sort of a blend of the uh, spiral prototyping type of life cycles. They do a lot, of, a lot of early prototyping to get an idea of whether something will work. And then once they they have the the thing reasonably well defined, uh, the concept reasonably well defined, then they're able to say, okay, right now we can we can turn this into an epic and we split that epic into user stories and bam, we'll go off and build it. Um, so that's usually what I see. So my point here is that. When you're you're talking about how to integrate 
your testing into into the life cycle. Think about what actually goes on, not what books say goes on and not what you think should go on, but what actually goes on, because these documents should not be aspirational documents. These documents should be operational documents. These documents should describe the world as it is, the world in which you live and how you deal with it effectively. Now, um, the policy and the strategy are going to be developed independent of a particular project, as I've mentioned. The plan, as I said, is something that is, um, you know, project specific. So if you're if you're following a sequential life cycle or a V model, then the test plan and the project plan should be written pretty much at the same time, um, and it should define entry and exit criteria, and the test activities and the project activities should all be lined up in that document. If you're following a traditional iterative life cycle like Rational Unified Process or RUP, then the plan would be written during what's referred to as project inception and might be revised or appended at the start of each iteration. Remember, uh, RUP style iterations are, are big and are months long, not, not like weeks. Sometimes people will ask me, you know, really, is there still RUP out there? Well, <laughs> Yeah, not necessarily under that name, not that people necessarily recognize that that's what they're doing, but there are plenty of organizations that are doing it. Um, I have one, one client in particular that I can think of that has these, these enormous releases that go on a couple years and uh, they're broken down into iterations and they have, you know, thousand plus people on these projects. I mean, there's, there's a good 400 or so testers involved. Um, and they have, they, they are basically doing RUP. When they described what they were doing to me, I'm like, oh, that's RUP. They're like, you recognize it, RUP? And they're like, who's RUP? It sounds like a noise a dog makes, you know. But it is still out there. If you're not familiar with it, <clears throat> go give it a read. You may find out, oh, wow, guess what? We're doing RUP. Um, now, in an agile life cycle, um, probably you're going to rely mostly on your strategy. Um, you may have a, a test plan, a brief document that describes some project specific uh, strategy implementation details of uh, who, you know, when, those kinds of things. Um, that would be written uh, beginning of the release as part of release planning. Um, might be revised or appended at the start of an iteration, but it shouldn't be really. If you're, if you're starting two week iterations by sitting down and having to do modifications to your test plan, you're definitely doing it wrong. Your your agile test plan should be written in a way that they are content independent. In other words, they're describing the process. And they're not they're not dependent on any particular set of user stories being built. Okay, so that's a what I would consider to be a quick um, discussion of policies, strategies, and plans. I say consider it quick in that this is something like when we do our advanced test manager course, um, we spend pretty much a day on this topic of going through it. But uh, this is sort of the the, the higher level view. Um, hopefully it gives you some, some food for thought. Um, just to recap, we are going to try to define what we want to accomplish and how best to accomplish it. All right, what, what we want to accomplish, that's the, the uh, it captured in the policy, and then the, the how we want to accomplish it, that's in a general way, the strategy, and for the specific project, the plan. Um, I mentioned alignment, making sure that you've got alignment across the document. So basically every everything that's in the policy, you can point to something in the strategy that's about making that happen. Everything that's in the strategy clearly supports something that's in the policy. And when you go down to the plan level, plan is the is, is describing how the strategy will be carried out. If there needs to be deviation from the strategy for some particular reason, fine. Go right ahead and do that. Document why. But should be really clear how those things relate to each other. Now, relevance. Again, I want to come back to this. Relevance is really critical. If it don't write it down if if everybody knows it. Uh, don't write it down if the uh, stakeholder group that the document's intended for doesn't need to know it. Uh, 
you know, make sure that you're, you're addressing this issue of relevance. And, and again, if you use Confluence or Wiki pages or something like that, you can keep track of, you know, how are people actually looking at this? Um, and that will help you, you know, check for relevance. Be concise. Um, less words, better than more. You know, hitting somebody with a wall of text is certainly not particularly helpful. I mean, there's a, there's a great little acronym that some of you may or may not have heard, TLDR, too long, didn't read. Um, yeah, keep it short. Um, use examples. Um, it's okay to um, uh, split it up and have it in different places. So you may have your strategy fragmented into uh, multiple documents that talk about different topics. Again, as long as people know where to find that information. Um, focus on the things that are important and the things that people actually need to know. Okay, so as usual, I will put the uh, advertisement up here. It's the end of the presentation. We'll get into Q&A, but before we get to the questions, please remember that if you feel that insights and ideas like the ones you've just heard could help with your testing challenges, uh, please make us your preferred software testing vendor for any and all expert services, consulting, or training. Send us an email, info at rbcs-us.com. Let us know how we can help you, and we will send you a quote. So let's see, what do we got here? Questions. Andrew says, thank you. Well, you're quite welcome, Andrew. Um, Zolt says, as mentioned, the test plan should contain what to test and what not to. What is the optimal criteria to decide on this? Um, well, part, some of this has to do with risk. And so your risk analysis should be helping you make this decision. Um, some of it has to do with just, you know, what's what's practical, right? Um, I mean, you, you may not have the uh, tools necessary to um, automate all of your regression tests or even any of your regression tests, right? So that practicality is a part of it. Uh, some of it also just relates to who's the right group or right person to own something, right? So you saw in the policy, there was that dividing up of ownership there. So, you know, those are some of the criteria that, that help you like, you know, risk and risk and constraints and, and optimal ownership. There can be others. Um, Alex and us, Asharani both say thank you. So you're welcome. Um, Kevin says, how are test plans practical in an Agile SDLC? Can't most of this be covered by the strategy doc? Uh, yes. Uh, mo uh, in an Agile scenario, as I think I mentioned, you really do want to get, um, you want to migrate as much of this stuff into a strategy. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that, that is generally true in the sense of, when I say generally true, I mean, it's true not just of testing, it's true of development as well that a lot of uh, the, the best functioning agile implementations that I have seen have this really super regular cadence and set of rituals and so forth. And the process is really pretty, pretty well internalized. And so, yeah, you know, it's, it, th there's a strategy uh, in, in the ISDQB terminology, but you don't, you don't have a plan. Pardon me, I need a drink of water there. Um, now that said, there there may be specific things that need to be documented during release planning, as I mentioned on a previous slide, that you know about how the strategy is going to be implemented. So don't say, oh, because we're agile, we don't use test plans. You know, it's more a matter of we we definitely minimize the use of test plans because most stuff's in the strategy. Um, Navya, who's left, but I'll answer her question anyway, says, can we have examples of effectiveness and efficiency testing metrics? Um, rather than try to give a 90 second answer to what is a really long, um, discussion, what I would suggest is that, uh, those of you who are curious about this, go grab a copy of the expert test manager syllabus 
And in the expert test manager syllabus, there is a discussion of metrics in chapter nine, uh, sections two and three. And uh, that's got some examples of effectiveness and efficiency metrics. And it also has a good explanation of what the difference is between effectiveness and efficiency. And you, in addition to that resource, there's also like um, various recorded webinars that I've done, stupid metrics tricks being just one of them, that relate to metrics. And so I'd, I'd, I'd refer people to that. Um, Alex says, I always had a problem getting the email for PDU. So, um, hmm. Go to webinar automatically sends to every attendee an email, which we, RBCS, um, predefine prior to the webinar that has this information in it. So I, I the only thing that I can figure if you're having a problem getting these, these PDU emails is that there's some sort of spam filtering or something that's that's getting between you and the and and the email that's that's coming out from from go to webinar um because uh you know it's 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 an automated process and it's something that it uh um you know it, the, the the whole thing works well enough that the, the the process works you know what i mean um so alex if you're if you're having some specific issues what i would recommend is that you try to address those with citrix slash go to webinar and see why that might be i get you saying it's on your whitelist alex but uh, it's it's not something that that's that we rbcs do is what i'm saying we it, it's not like we have a little pdu elf in the back of the office who sits there and sends out emails to each attendee and is doesn't like you Alex and isn't going to send you the the emails that's that's it's it's a fully automated thing being done by our vendor um so it's it's difficult for me to to um uh provide any insight as to why that might be breaking down now Beth says I have a registration email and one saying the webinar is starting, but it doesn't have a PDU number. That's right, Beth. You will not, you do not get a PDU number until the end. So just to recap something that I mentioned at the, uh, at the top, um, only people who attend the entire webinar get the email. Um, so that, then that's a, that's a, that's a PMI rule. That's not something that we can do anything about. So, so only at the end, will will um you guys end up getting that email um and it's also possible that if you were to drop off you know and not be not get back on that may create a problem <coughs> excuse me uh, let's see tyler says as a new tester creating a test strategy can be intimidating especially as it is a dynamic document is there a good way to know when you are done during the initial planning well, um, I would say that if you want, you know, if you're going to make mistakes, the mistake you want to make is under documenting, not over documenting, because then you just go back and add later when you find that you've missed something. Right. But it, the, the more common mistake is that people over document. They document a bunch of stuff that isn't really relevant. And then people come to the conclusion, ah, oh, this it's planning and strategizing and stuff's just a waste of time, and then they stop doing it entirely. So uh, I would say start with some of the stuff where you know for sure you need to have captured. Like, you know, how does a def how does proper defect management done? What are the criteria that are used to determine priority and severity? Uh, how do you assign uh, root causes, for example? Those sort of things. That's kind of stuff that is not not immediately obvious and people tend to not do it the same way it's a candidate for a good place to start Paula says how can I select a suitable testing technique especially if I can apply more than one on a specific case um, well Hala, I think we're now moving beyond planning to test design um, 
There are a number of recorded webinars on various test design techniques that are available out on our YouTube channel. So I would encourage you to go uh, give those a listen. Anything from uh, domain analysis to state-based testing to decision tables. Uh, Prashant says, have you come across a situation where entry criteria for test execution defined in the test plan was not met and it was still decided to go ahead with execution? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yep, very, very common. Um, and, you know, in that case, when you violate entry criteria or definition of ready, start testing on stuff that's maybe not really ready for testing. I think what we have to do as professional testers is just inform people that this is the risk that you're taking by doing this. And if people say, that's fine, we'll take that risk, then, you know, you, you need to go ahead and do what you can do. Um, it might make sense to have that response of, that's fine, we'll take that risk in writing, in an email or something, because there are certainly cases that I am aware of where it was demonstrated to my satisfaction that uh, uh, an organization th basically threw the testers under the bus, as the cliche goes, for quality problems that were actually something that the tester kind of warned them about. But that gets us out of the realm of strategy and into politics, and so we'll stay out of there. Hollis says, is it normal to test on a production environment or is testing on a pre-production environment enough? Um, I hate this. I hate to do this because, you know, this is this always strikes me as the either the beginning of an endless round of bloviation when I hear it or as a dodge. But this is one of those cases where it really does. The answer to this question really does depend on a lot of different considerations. Um, you know, think about testing software that run that's that controls a nuclear reactor okay um obviously you're going to do as much testing as you possibly can in simulated type of situations that's not a production environment um and it's not a perfect replica of a production environment so to some extent when that software gets released into the nuclear reactor you know you're testing it in a production environment uh, same thing with the the software that they use for the International Space Station. I mean, it, it's they test the heck out of it for apparently a year, but you know the space station is its its own thing, and they've got a simulation of it, an environment that simulates it, but it's not an exact simulation. They did have a situation a few years ago where they pushed an update up to the space station and it shut down the communications. Um, you know, I mean, the gold standard for a uh, test environment is a complete 100% replica of your production environment. Um, and to the extent that you move away from that, you accept risks. And so you just have to say, well, you know, what are the risks associated with each difference between the test environment and the production environment? And what do those risks mean to us? Uh, how can we mitigate them by means other than than spending money on environments? Uh, you know, how can we make sure that our testing is done in such a way that it's minimized sensitivity to that? But, yeah, complicated question, and it's all the more complicated that it's associated with a boatload of money in a lot of cases. Some of our clients are really lucky, and they, they're operating 100% in the cloud. I say lucky, I mean lucky in this, in, in this in terms of test environments. They're operating 100% in the cloud, and so they can just spin up a replica of their production environment immediately using their cloud service provider and then turn it off when they're done using it. Um, you know, but if you're not in that situation, test environments can be painful. Adu says, thank you. Any tips to consider when creating the test strategy? Uh, to overcome the scenario that the last few items to be tested in continuous integration environments ends up in system tests instead. Um, hmm. well, it sounds like you're saying that the automated tests that are in your, your delivery pipeline or CI framework are not as complete as they could be. Um, you know, that, that happens. I mean, you're... 
you, your, your test strategy, again, as I said, has to be predicated on the real world in which it's going to exist. And so if you know that there are certain upstream weaknesses in the process that create or exacerbate risks from a quality point of view, you just have to be, you, you have to strategize accordingly. Karen said, did you mention test readiness reviews? Shouldn't this be required before testing to document new risks and document the readiness key input needed for input in the testing requiring signatures for key stakeholders? Um, I didn't mention those. Um, in sequential life cycles, you're absolutely right, Karen. It's very common for organizations to have test readiness reviews or test level entry meetings or uh, test phase kickoff meetings. They go by a bunch of different names, but, you know, checking to see that you satisfied the entry criteria or meet the definition of ready, whatever phrase you're, you're using. And, you know, as you said, maybe getting sign off, um, these are somewhat, I was going to say less common. I guess, I guess it's more, it's more a matter that these things kind of get subsumed into other, um, sort of rituals or ceremonies that tend to be part of agile. Um, and so I think it's it, the same discussions can be happening, but they're not happening as a separate discussion. Um, but yes, I mean, certainly uh, evaluation of, of entry and exit criteria, definition of ready, definition of done. This, ideally, that's all being done explicitly and to, to whatever degree there's formality associated with approving or disapproving sign-offs, et cetera, that that, that that is indeed happening. So good point. Thank you for the question. All right, well, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close this session down here. Um, just a little bit more about uh, resources available through RBCS, uh, free resources. Uh, these free web webinars run once a month, so check our website, rbcs-us.com, to sign up. If you want a special webinar presentation for your company only of this webinar or any other topic related to software testing, send us an email info at rbcs-us.com or contact us via our website. While you're at our website, you can sign up for our regular free newsletter, which will get you valuable discounts on consulting and training services and a regular newsletter that includes a featured article on software testing and quality and news about what RBCS and its partners are doing lately. For example, in the uh, upcoming newsletter, we're going to have an interview uh, that was conducted of, of me by uh, Agustina Gay of uh, ISKI, um, where I describe all of the new and interesting stuff that has happened with the Foundation 2018 syllabus. So that's the kind of thing that's in there. Um, you can follow us. You can see the Twitter coordinates here at RBCS and the on Facebook at Testing Approved by RBCS. Um, don't forget about the YouTube channel. Um, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn there. You see it's Rex dash black, um, send me a connection and uh, connection request and I will accept. Um, in terms of the YouTube channel, definitely subscribe to that. These, uh, recorded webinars are all posted out there. There's like a few hundred things. I think we're closing in on a thousand items on that resource going back years and years. And there's just all sorts of stuff out there. So, you know, take, take advantage of that for sure. We have one of our, our clients is saying that they are actually going to to uh, be posting some stuff, um, links to the YouTube videos on their learning management system, their in-house LMS. Um, so get in touch with us if you want to uh, hear about how to how to do that. Um, you can also subscribe to podcast versions of this um, webinar. Some of these webinars are more suitable for podcasts than others. This one had some graphics in it, so it might not be a great fit, but some are good. And, you know, podcasts are a great way to kind of keep up with with stuff in, in the background. I listen to podcasts while I'm working out or doing yard work and so forth. 
So the, we offer all these free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. But do remember that we need to keep the lights on. So anytime you need consulting, expert services, or training related to software testing or quality, please send us an email and allow us to provide you with a quote. We don't expect to win all your business, but we'd like the opportunity to compete for all your business. This concludes the webinar. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, see you next month.